There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of love, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, love. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that'll ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. The sweetest of loves When my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence The Holy Spirit You are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. The Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Well, good morning, church. Hope you're uh, excited to gather with us today. You can take a seat for a half a second. We're going to have a quick announcement and what's going on in our community right now. 
Um, if you are not a part of our email list, uh, Donna Prescott sends out an email every week letting you know what's going on in the different activities here at the church. we got a couple of Bible studies that are starting out this week for men's and women's. Our fall seasons are getting ready to get going as far as if you're looking to go deeper into conversations about faith and how to present your faith to other people. Um, Pastor Lance is going to be leading that uh, going forward. I think he's going to be doing it three-week intervals. So you'll go first three weeks of the month, get uh, the last month or the last Wednesday off, and then back into another series and conversation. And I notice everyone's got a couple more coats. Are we getting into the fall weather now? It's getting exciting. And then we have Damien, of course, our children of the mountains, uh, who still go into shorts every so often uh, when it's cold outside. But... Yes, we're just so excited. So one of the other things is we're back meeting in person for youth group. Uh, if you are youth age from sixth grade all the way up until 12th grade, we're meeting here at the church. Middle school is Wednesday nights at six o'clock and high school is Thursday nights at six o'clock. We're here from six to seven. Um, and we're just excited that we get that opportunity to spend time together, to worship God while giggling and having fun and trying to do something just a little bit crazy and sporadic. And also, we just have a bunch of things going on. If you haven't checked out, uh, if you were wondering, hey, what are we doing about words, or if you're new here, you can go into the back, and there's a QR co code that will send you to the worship itinerary uh, that has all of scripture verses, scripture readings, and all of the verses for uh, what we'll be singing here together. Uh, but as we talk about singing and dancing and a time to be together, uh, I was thinking about King David as he would stand and he would dance in revelation and in excitement because he was gathered with his people. And I'm just excited to gather with you. So allow us to stand up, to continue to worship, to step into what God has for us today. They're working on my road. And every time I leave the house, I know that they're working on my road. But I can't help it. I turn right out of my driveway like I have for 15 years. And then I see this stupid sign about a mile down the road. And I'm, oh, well, I got to turn around and go back. You know, there's so many things that are just reflexes in our life. And this is one that I'm working on to become my reflex. Just, just to stand in the affirmation and the love that God has for us. We're really glad you're here. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow tries to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the light. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love there's power that can break off every chain there's power that can empty out a grave. 
There's resurrection power that can save Power in your name Power in your name My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I Stand in your love mm -hmm. My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love Singing for Jesse is trying to sing in his key. <laughs> I've carried this burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it. Hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now, laying it down. I know that I need you. I run to the Father, fall into grace, done with the hiding, the reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon.
come before you this morning to say we love you. Lord, for you to be our Father is just almost something we can't comprehend. Lord, that you love us enough to sacrifice and send your Son. Father God, this is your trying times and a lot of people are hurting. Lord, I just pray that as we are your hands and your feet, that you would guide us into how we can lean into you. Lord, how to stand in your love and how to take strength and courage and peace and grace out into a world that needs it more than anything. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, just be with us this morning. Send your Holy Spirit here. Yeah. 
You can have a seat. Um, before we bring up our guest speaker today, I was really um, hit by that last song of the early church. And whenever they would mourn together, um, whether we're all mourning for the Watt family and everything that's going on in their household, we're mourning the loss of a graduation or the person who had to move away because of losing a job. I want to invite us into a moment of silent reflection where we can just get to mourn maybe something we've lost in 2020, whether it's um, a person close to us or some, an experience we got to miss out because of what is happening in our world. And if you don't have anything, uh, lift up Jetsy Watts and the whole Watts family. And if you're online with us, please just take a moment. We're going to be in silence. We're going to listen to the birds singing and 285 rushing by us. But you know, let's have a moment to just sit in this space. And if you'll pray with me, as Jesus has taught us to pray, by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for stepping into that space with us. And it truly is my honor to welcome up our special guest. Uh, he was a pastor in Texas for eight years, if my memory serves me correctly, before joining the ranks of academia, getting his doctorate degree, and one of my personal favorite professors down at Denver Seminary, Dr. Don Payne, is our special guest to preach for us for today. So. I'm going to welcome him up uh, and allow him to have this moment of being with us. So, thank you, Dr. Payne. Thanks, Wes. Is this on? Am I on? Okay. Good morning. It's always a treat for my wife Sharon and I to be back with you folks. We, uh, we love coming up and seeing familiar faces. If you have a copy of the scriptures handy, or if I, sh I guess I should say these days, if you just have your phone handy, um, turn in your phone to the book of 1 Corinthians. That sounds so strange to say that, but I guess that fits more of us these days, doesn't it? Uh, we're going to be looking at the, uh, the book, Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church in just a moment. It's no surprise to anybody that our, our country these days is probably as divided or more divided than it has been maybe since the 1960s, perhaps. Um, and sadly, in many instances, the church is just as divided as the rest of the country is. That is true of the church overall. That is true, tragically, in lots and lots of individual congregations. There are congregations even in the Denver area, Bible-believing evangelical congregations that are being ripped apart internally at the seams over political matters. So we're in a bad time. And what do we do? Where, where is the hope? Uh, we, we talk about that a lot. And, and in fact, uh, many, it's not, it's not uncommon for, for us to hear people, Christian and non-Christian alike, say, 
we've, we've got to be unified. We've got to come together, right? Well, all that may be true, but that doesn't say anything. That doesn't tell us what to do. So what do we do? Where is the hope for everything that is ripping us apart? Well, the answer will probably not surprise you in some way, but it may also surprise you in another way. What we're going to see from a couple of different uh, sections of Paul's letter in 1 Corinthians is that the answer is this common word that Christians call holiness. If you've been around the church for any length of time and you have a little bit of theological vocabulary, you may also have heard the word sanctification, to be sanctified. Now, that may be the answer. That may not surprise you that I would say a thing like that. But what may surprise you in a little bit is how that is the answer. Now, what are, what are some of the common conceptions people have of what it means to be holy or to be sanctified? What does that mean? That it comes from a Latin word, sanctus, which means to be consecrated or, or, or holy. Uh, and when we think of holy people, what, what do we think of? Who do we think of? You might think of Mother Teresa or people who throughout the history of the church have been called saints, St. Saint Augustine, St. Saint Paul, other saints, right? We think of people who have attained some really high or noble level of spirituality or maturity, right? Many of you have probably seen at some point in your life the, uh, the old, uh, by now it's an old movie, Chariots of Fire, uh, the true story of the Scottish runner Eric Little. And uh, if you know the rest of Little's story, after he won his gold medal in the 1924 Olympics, uh, he went to China and spent the rest of his life there as a missionary. He was the son of missionaries and had been born in China, I believe, and returned to China after the 24 Olympics. And he died uh, at about age 45 in a, a Japanese internment camp in China, along with a lot of other Westerners. Uh, a guy named Langdon Gilkey was uh, a young American English teacher who was in that compound with him. It was called the Shantung Compound in China. Uh, he wrote about his experience of three or four years with a lot of other Westerners, Christian or non-Christian alike, in the Shantung Compound. And he recalled that of all the people he knew, Eric Little, he says, if there ever was a person who was a genuine saint, it was Eric Little. Now that fits our common profile of what it means to be a saint or to be sanctified, to be holy, right? To be a, a, a person who is kind of a cut above in one's maturity, one's character, one's spiritual life. One website I found just defined the saint as what we're all hoping to become. It kind of fits, doesn't it? Being especially good, being especially virtuous, being especially moral, being especially mature. Um, but I want us to wait a second because the picture that the Scripture actually gives us, and this, this is where some of the surprise may begin to come in. The picture that the Scripture actually gives us of holiness is not something out in front of us that we have yet to attain. The picture the Scripture consistently gives us of holiness or sanctification is something behind us that God has decisively done for us. God has made us holy. Now, does that mean that you and I as followers of Jesus have already arrived? No, not on your life, at least if you're anything like me. Does that mean that we have our character all together? or that we've already attained these levels of spirituality. Not at all. Because that, as it turns out, is not what holiness is primarily. It's got implications for that. But that is not this picture that the Bible gives us of what it means to be a sanctified or a holy person. And so the biblical picture of being a saint or being sanctified or being holy has often been kind of misshapen 
it's been flipped backwards. And so let's uh, take a look at a, a couple of vignettes in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and see how being sanctified or being holy begins to speak into the very things that are tearing us apart as a country and particularly as a church. Now, if, um, <clears throat> excuse me, before modern modes of transportation, um, almost uh, m many of the vices, the worst vices that we know in society were found in port cities. And I say before modern modes of transportation because now almost anything can be delivered almost anywhere, right? But before those modern modes of transportation, port cities were where all the goods came and went. And so if you wanted uh, all the new stuff, all the novel stuff, or all the worst stuff, it was always to be found in port cities. And the ancient city of Corinth was just that. It was a port city. It was located on an isthmus that sort of connected Greece and Rome. And actually, it had two ports on either side of the isthmus. And so just about every conceivable vice, every form of debauchery, uh, every form of novelty that anybody could ever want was found in Corinth. That was true for hundreds of years. But in the mid-first century, through the Apostle Paul, the gospel found its way to that wretched city of Corinth, that port city. The gospel found its way there. A church begins to flourish. And yet, over the years, as the gospel begins to take root in those people's lives in the mid-first century, you find these people who, on one hand, had been gripped by the redeeming grace of Jesus Christ, their lives had been turned around. And at the same time, they were still a mess in just about any and every way you can imagine. And so Paul wrote to them at least two letters. We have evidence that he probably wrote more letters to them, but we have two of his letters we call First and Second Corinthians. And in those two letters, particularly in the first one, we'll take a look at, in those two letters, Paul affirms them in many ways about the wonderful things God had done in their lives. And he also gets after them pretty hard because they had a lot of things turned around backwards. But what's really interesting about, about what Paul says to them is his very first comment. If you look at chapter 1, verse 1, Paul addresses them as holy people. Now, depending upon the English translation you have, it may use a different word. May he, call, he may call them saints in some translations, or holy ones, or sanctified ones, but it's all the same word, which is holy. To the holy ones, the sanctified ones, the saints at Corinth. Now, some people may read, if you read a book like 1 Corinthians, or many of the other letters of Paul and some of them of Peter as well. You may read those very first introductory comments and think that's just a throwaway line. You know, like the, uh, the, the introduction to an email where you say, hey, hey, so-and-so, how you doing? Hope you're well, hope everything's good, blah, 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 blah. Now here's what I really want to talk about. But no, this is not a throwaway line. This is a profound theological statement to the saints the holy ones, the sanctified ones in Corinth. Now, Paul is right there putting down a, a peg in the ground that we're going to tie something to that's going to be profoundly important for us because Paul looks at people who were very messed up, people who, who were engaged in some really despicable conduct with each other in some ways, people who had a lot to learn, people who had a lot of growth yet out in front of them, and he tells them they're holy. Now, if we have these common perceptions that holiness is, is a level of maturity or a level of spirituality, that sounds really odd, doesn't it? But this is where it starts, that holiness, 
Sanctification is something God has already done for us. Doesn't mean we're mature. Doesn't mean we're spiritually deep. It doesn't mean we've got it all together by any means. But it's something God has done for us. Now, before we get into these two little scenarios that I want us to look at in chapter 3 and in chapter 6, let's give a little bit of background to this claim that holiness is something God has already done. Where do we get that notion? Where do I get that notion? It really starts in the Old Testament. And you can trace it pretty easily if you look at where holiness language starts. In the Old Testament, it's often called consecration or holiness. In the New Testament, sanctification or holiness. But look at where that language starts in the Old Testament, and you find something very interesting. You find that a group of ragtag people we know as the nation of Israel were called by God to be God's special people. They were set apart by God. They were set apart for God. They were cleansed of their sins and they were brought into the presence of God. And that, in real summary form, is the biblical picture of what it means to be holy, to be sanctified or to be consecrated. It means to be fitted by God for the presence of God and for the purposes of God. To be fitted by God for God's presence and God's purposes. This is why in the Old Testament for, for, for ages, the priests, who were not necessarily more mature or spiritual people, but they were selected to come into the presence of God to represent the rest of the people. The priests had to be ritually cleansed of their sins to be brought into the presence of God. It's even why, interestingly, Inanimate objects, things, were called holy. So, the altar itself, even utensils that were going to be used in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, all of those had to be ceremonially cleansed and made holy. Why? Well, not because the materials they were made of changed. That didn't change. But because they were going to be in the presence of God. And this is the consistent storyline we see all through the Old Testament, that anybody or even anything that was going to come into the presence of the living God had to be made holy, had to be set apart for special purposes, had to be cleansed. Why? Because it was going to come into God's presence and be used for God's purposes. Now, out of that, we see all kinds of obligations and implications for people that if they were set apart, if they were made holy, then they needed to work on their character. They needed to start to live consistently with who they were. But that didn't make them more holy. That changed them because they were holy. And that we can trace all the way through the Scriptures, even into the New Testament. That is the picture of holiness, the picture of sanctification that the Scripture gives us. That to be holy, to be sanctified, is to be made fit by the cleansing from sins and by the calling of God. To made, be made fit to be in the presence of God and to be used for the purposes of God. That means that anybody who has put the weight of their life through faith in Jesus Christ is holy, been set apart, been consecrated for the presence of God and the purposes of God. That's good. I, think, I find that kind of staggering, that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you're holy. St. Joe, St. Sue, St. Sharon, St. Bill, St. Anne, whatever your name is, put saint in front of it. To the saints, in conifer to the holy ones the sanctified ones in conifer now let's go back to corinth if you've read this letter at all or know anything about it you know that this was a church that was internally very divided in fact this first letter paul writes to them is sort of a laundry list of issues paul is getting after 
that were dividing them. And he almost goes down his checklist, his punch list, one thing after another. We get to chapter 3. I'm just going to pick out two scenarios. Get to chapter 3. And we find that there, Paul is getting after them because they were dividing over their preferred leaders. Some of them were saying, well, I follow Apollos. Some of them were saying, well, I follow Paul. Well, I follow Peter. You know, so they were already kind of lining up with different leaders, maybe different teachers, different ways of thinking, different emphases that they thought really, really were on point. This person, this leader, this writer, this speaker, uh, they really... They really get it. I line up with them. We can see that happening in the church all over the place today, can't we? And they were dividing over that. And Paul addresses that in chapter 3, if you just kind of scan through that. And he, he names what they were doing, what they were saying. But then he comes to about verse 16. And he makes this sort of rhetorical question. I'm going to paraphrase it. He says, do you not know who you are? You, and he speaks in the plural, he says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, after everything he's just said about them dividing internally over what leader they preferred, who they followed, where does that comment fit? Do you not know who you are? You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You, collectively, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Here's why that's significant. Put that against the backdrop of what happened, what I mentioned, in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, for ages, even though the whole people were called holy and they got to come into God's presence to a certain distance or within a certain proximity, only the high priest got to go into the immediate presence of God one time a year. That's the way it was, that way it worked in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. Only one person of all the holy people got to go into the holy of holies, the, the, the immediate presence of God. That was the high priest, and the high priest only got to do that one time a year. Well, what changes? What happens when the Spirit of God is poured out on all people at Pentecost? Every time people gather in the name of Jesus, the Spirit of the living God is there with the same proximity that happened with the old, in the Old Testament only one time a year for the high priest. Now, every believer is a priest. Peter goes on and says that in one of his letters, that we are now a kingdom of priests. Now, that means a lot of things. But at the very least, that means that every one of us have the same access to the immediate presence of God that only the high priest did only once a year for ages in the Old Testament. We are a kingdom of priests. But it's not just individual access. Paul says to them in 1 Corinthians 3.16, you together are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You now are compared to what used to happen in the Old Testament. You now are the very dwelling place of God. Do you not know who you are? You now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You now are the residence of the presence of the living God. God is here among you. He says to the Corinthians, how dare you treat each other this way? Do you, how, how dare you divide with each other over whose teaching you like better or who you think has a better perspective on each other? That's not who you are. This is who you are. The presence of the living God lives here. That's who you are. And that means that holiness creates our unity. Not what teachers we line up with or like. Not what political parties we align with. Nothing defines who we are but the presence of the living God. We're a holy people. Not because we're a good people. <laughs> because we're not. 
I mean, I don't know most of you very well, okay? But I'm just going to assume you're not good people. <laughs> you're probably really nice people. And you're probably really fun people. And you probably do a lot of great things. But in terms of the holiness of God, are you good people? Yeah, probably not. <laughs> but you're holy people because God lives here. And that's who you are. That's who all Christians are. That's what creates our unity. Not whether we see things the same way, even in terms of Scripture, or in terms of politics, or in terms of community values. The one thing that creates our unity and tells us who we are is the presence of the living God. God has made us a holy, sanctified people. I'm... Uh, I'm one of four children, and three of us are still living, and our, uh, our parents are still alive, elderly, frail, but our, our parents are still living. But at our age, you can only imagine that uh, our four siblings, we've had a lot of fusses over the years. I don't know many siblings who haven't, but my siblings and I, the, the two still live, uh, two still living and I, um, we are very, very different people. And we think very differently on many issues. And we have had some tough, tough conversations together. But I was reminded of something just last night because uh, one of my siblings who li still lives in Texas is up because uh, our dad's in very, very ill health. And so we're trying to rally around him and we're as many of you have, you know, we're dealing with long-term care issues and financial issues and medical issues for our elderly parents and going through all of that. So we're, uh, we were together for dinner last night. And I was reminded that as many differences as my sisters and I have had and as, um, as many harsh words as sometimes have been uttered by mostly them toward me, never me toward them, Something different happened when we were with our parents. It reminded us that there was something bigger to who the three of us are than the things we have fussed about. It reminded me of that. Um, we probably wouldn't fuss in the presence of our elderly parents anyway, just out of politeness. But more than that, it reminded me that we are pains. That's not a name that everybody would maybe gravitate toward. Um, you know, I should have been a dentist, not a theologian, but, uh, but, but we are pains. That's who we are. And being in the presence of our parents reminded me of that, that there's something that transcends all the things that my sisters and I would fuss about over the years. And on a, just take that out to a whole nother level. The fact that the living God has chosen to be present among us. Make us his temple. That ought to shape our ways with each other. That'll shape the ways we talk to each other. That'll shape this, not only the stuff we fuss about, but it'll shape the way we fuss about what we fuss about. Right? There's one other little vignette that we need to take a look at, and that's in chapter 6. So look over there if you if you can. And we find something rather similar taking place in 1 Corinthians 6, but it's even perhaps more serious because there some of these Christians were taking each other to court. Some of these Christians were so divided. What, what was at issue, we don't exactly know, but some of them were so divided from each other and could not or would not work out their difficulties that they took each other to public court. And Paul is aghast at this. And he says, I won't read through the text, you can scan it, but Paul says to them two or three things. He says, is there not anybody among you who can help you resolve your difficulties? And if there is not, secondly, how can you not, based on God's grace, just take a loss? How can you not just absorb the loss rather than having to win? 
And thirdly, he says to them in so many words, how dare you take this kind of thing to the public arena where the whole world is going to see, basically, that the gospel has made no difference in your life. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but this is the gist of what Paul says. How dare you take squabbles that you can't resolve or won't resolve, take them into the public arena, and let those who do not know the Lord help you resolve an issue. And by doing that, you've essentially said that the grace of God is really not all that powerful to do that much in your life. And then in verse 11, this is where we want to really focus. He says to them in blunt fashion, you have been justified before God, and you have been sanctified. He doesn't tell them, you need to be sanctified. He tells them, you have been sanctified. You have been made holy. Now, just as in chapter 3, what's the flow of the logic there? Why that kind of a statement after he chastises them for taking each other to court? to the public courts to resolve their difficulties. Because once again, he's telling them, that is not who you are. What defines you is the gospel. What defines you is the grace of God. And the grace of God that has come to you as making you a holy person, cleansing you from sin, and fitting you for God's presence and God's purposes. That gospel... That grace is more powerful than anything you fuss about. And that grace is even what will give you the ability to absorb a loss if you can't work it out. So, the presence of God through holiness is what creates our unity. We saw that in chapter 3. And it's also what enables our witness to the world. Holiness, sanctification is what tells us who we are and it's what gives us the power to live the gospel as well as talk about the gospel. Holiness, being a holy people, being a sanctified people, even as the uh, sometimes immature or ragtag people we all are, holiness is what enables the gospel to be lived out publicly as well as articulated verbally. The gospel has to be lived. It's a lived reality as well as a spoken reality. And so how we are with each other when things are most difficult is the acid test of the gospel. And how we are with each other when things are most difficult, even for us in times like we occupy, whatever it is we may fuss over, whatever it is we may be tempted to divide over, whether that's as a worldwide church or as a congregation. Whatever we're tempted to divide over will reflect whether we know who we are. It'll reflect how deep the gospel has driven its roots into our lives, whether the gospel is merely something we talk about or something we actually live whether the grace of God, we believe, is deep enough and powerful enough to carry us through whatever we face. Or is it just a word? And that's all about holiness. That's all about knowing who we are as people whose lives are now defined by living in the presence of God and being set apart for the purposes of God. Why would God select any of us? to come into God's presence and to be used for God's purposes? It's a good question. Why did God select the nation of Israel? They were just one small nation out of many. And God even tells them in the Old Testament, I didn't choose you because you were particularly noble or good. I chose you so that my grace and my glory would be amplified in contrast. Now, that's both... Um, it gives us an obligation, and it also is kind of liberating, isn't it? God doesn't use us simply when we have it together. God doesn't make himself present to us simply when 
we're spiritually fine-tuned. God makes himself present to us. God sets us apart for his purposes and then calls us to live into it. He tells us, this is who you are. I'm present to you. I've called you. I'm going to use you. You're holy. Now, live into that. Now, be that. Now, be who you are. Yeah, we do have obligations. We do have responsibilities. We've got to grow up. We've got to grow into who we are. But we can only grow into who we are as holy people because we've been made holy people. We have been set apart. We've been sanctified. And that, friends, is, uh, is this powerful, powerful enactment, embodiment of the gospel. And that gospel, just to remind you, is this truth that we are in a predicament of our own doing, and, an, and it's a predicament from which we cannot extract ourselves. We cannot redeem ourselves. No creature, as one early church father Athanasius put it, no creature can redeem another creature. Only God can redeem us. We're all in a predicament with God, with each other, with ourselves that we cannot resolve. We cannot redeem ourselves. We cannot reconcile ourselves. We cannot even, in contrast to a popular line, we cannot forgive ourselves. We can only be forgiven. That's the gospel. And God loved us enough to come personally and, and take all of the consequences of our predicament on God's own self, out of love. God absorbed his own judgment against sin so that we could live, so we could be set free. God redeemed us. God ransomed us. God bought us back. That's the gospel. And that's pure, undiluted, unfiltered grace coming our way. That gospel, that grace that comes our way is what makes us a holy people, a sanctified people, a set-apart people, a cleansed people, a called people. That's who we are. And when we remember who we are, that changes everything. When we remember who we are as people marked by the very presence of God, that'll change our behavior. That'll change the way we see each other. I often like to think of the church as a bucket. A bucket that a lot of different people have been dropped into for one basic reason. The grace of God through Jesus Christ. And then we find ourselves in this bucket. We stand up and we look around and we see ourselves in that bucket with a lot of other people we probably would not have chosen as friends. But there we are, in the bucket, together. And what drops us in the bucket and what keeps us in the bucket is that we're now a holy people. And now, as a holy people... We're called to figure out what it means to live that out. Live out that gospel of grace that put us in the bucket to begin with. If we know who we are, if we know we're holy, and if we know what holiness means, that changes everything. That takes hope. That gives some substance to the hope that we all say we need. That tells us a little bit about what to do when we don't know what to do tells us what forgiveness and grace, grace look like because we're holy. We're not good, <laughs> but we are holy. Let's pray together. Our Father, we can only give you thanks as the Holy One for looking our way, taking us seriously, valuing our lives, calling us to yourself, cleansing us from our sin and making yourself present to us and giving us a mission, giving us a role in what it means for you to express your grace to the rest of the world. Lord, in the 
time like we occupy, at least in this country, we need you to help, help us be who we are. We need you, Lord, to empower our witness to the world so that they can see that the gospel is real and the gospel is more powerful than anything else that divides us. Help us, Lord. Help us to live into who you have made us to be through Christ our Lord. Amen. I love it when Don comes to preach for us. Thank you, Don. Dr. Payne. Would have made a good dentist name, maybe a good wrestler name. Like, oh, yeah. Brother. You know, we're, we're not alone in that call to go live this holy life. You know, Paul talks about how we've got advantages that Elijah didn't have in the form of the Holy Spirit. So I just felt like, uh, I felt like we should sing our first song again, Holy Spirit. Thank you all for coming out this morning. We'll probably get one, maybe two more weeks like this. We're working on plans to move inside, so rest assured that we're not going to just go back to online stuff. We're, we're figuring it out. We're working on it. Look for something in your email this week. If you guys have comments on that or if you want to be part of the team that's figuring that stuff out, let me know, okay? Myself and the rest of the elders are, are working through that. Will you stand with me? So as we sing this song, the lyric says, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. I don't want you to think about here as here. I want you to think about here as here. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You are living home. Your presence I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of love Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Glory God is what our hearts long for. To be
and what an experience that is. Thank you to our worship team. Thank you for Dr. Payne coming out and being with us. And thank you guys for coming and spending your Sunday morning with us, whether in person or online. But know that you, as you go forth, receive this benediction. But know as you go forth, do you do not leave the church because where you are, there the church is. Because we, as the people of God, are the church. So go forth loving your neighbors and knowing that we are all in the same bucket. You're loved, you're appreciated, and we'll see you next week.